Hey everyone, so today I want to give you a tour of my books. So as some of you have asked me to go through the books on my pile besides my filming place, I also finally pulled a bunch of books out of storage here and I'm gonna share them with you. And I hope these are most of my books. Um, my storage unit is pretty deep, but these were right at the front. And they're mostly gonna be physics books or chemistry, AI, machine learning, some startup books and some of the fun books that I like to read. So let's get started. All right, so first in this box, I think these are a lot of my physics books. So let's go through them. First book on the pile is Quantum Mechanics, The Theoretical Minimum, What You Need to Know to start doing physics. And I really like this book. It's by Leonard Susskind. This is a great book. It's a pretty easy read, but it actually like legitimately teaches you physics. There's like the pop science physics books that kind of talk about these theories, but this has actual equations in it, but it actually teaches you a lot in a very approachable way. So I would really recommend this actually, if you're completely new to quantum mechanics, uh, take a look at this book. Ooh, so the Landau Lifshitz series. So I don't know how many of you all know this, the Landau books in physics are classics. And this is clearly a very old book. I think I stole it from my dad. It's actually his copy and I didn't buy it. Uh, lots of highlighting in here. But there's a whole series of these Landau books that are fantastic for physics. These are kind of the classic textbooks exploratory data analysis with MATLAB. I actually have not touched this book. I think I stole it from my dad as well. I was not required to take MATLAB in school. I took Python, but I took this in one class. I think they asked us to use MATLAB, but my lab partner, she actually knew how to do MATLAB and I didn't. So I never actually opened this book. Nonlinear dynamics and chaos. So this is for our chaos class, which I also never took. I think I decided to take nanotechnology instead, but this is the classic Steven Strogatz book. So if you want to know about nonlinear dynamics and chaos theory, this is the book. All right, classical dynamics. So one of the four pillars of physics. So in school, when you're doing a physics degree, what happens is usually there's kind of the four pillars that you need to take. And that's classical mechanics, quantum mechanics, thermodynamic and statistical mechanics, and electromagnetics. So this was my classical mechanics textbook. So like I said, the pillars of physics, right? So I have Mere Thermodynamics by Don Lemons, and this is an actually really tiny book, but we covered this in my thermodynamics class, and it was actually really funny. So a lot of my friends were taking the aerospace engineering courses, and their thermodynamics textbooks were like 1,000, 1,200 pages, and just huge, and it was one of the hardest classes in aerospace, and this was my thermodynamics book, so when we would study together, they'd get really upset because this was definitely uh, very different from the textbook that they went through. Thermodynamics in physics is actually very different than thermodynamics in engineering, so our books look very, very different. The next in that series of the pillars is thermal physics. So this is the next step. This is kind of statistical mechanics. Intro to StatMech would be the class that I took this in, and this is the classic Cattell book. And he also has some great salt. Oh, here it is. So he also has a great solid state physics class. So this builds upon thermal physics and I really enjoyed solid state physics. Actually, fun story. So my dad was a postdoc at UC Berkeley when I was a little kid, I was seven years old and I would actually go to work with him and go to the lab and there's a bunch of pictures that I have from that and uh, Cattell actually worked at Berkeley so apparently my dad would drop me off in Cattell's office and I would like draw or play on paint or something on his computer when I was seven, eight, nine, ten years old. So also love the Cattell books. They're really good. Solid state physics, I really enjoyed StatMech because I had an awesome professor there but also these books are really good, really approachable. So now I have a lot of interesting and maybe specific quantum books. Um, I guess my actual quantum mechanics books are in another box and I'll get through them, but this is a quantum optics book. My undergrad advisor, Alex Kuzmich, uh, Emil Wolf was actually his advisor. So we had the optical coherence and quantum optics book. Clearly I'm a book hoarder, especially in quantum mechanics because I have this quantum physics book, which I never used. I used the Griffiths book, which should be somewhere in here, and Shankar, like most people do. But this is another quantum physics book that I have. And picturing quantum processes. I'm an experimentalist, so things like this book 
were things that I used a lot more because this is a book on superconducting circuits and devices and so that was uh, more more useful which you know I also took from my dad as well and have this copy here. More math books. So this is actually from grad school my first year where I took math methods class for physics and I really actually really like this book. This was something that I had not really done very thoroughly. I always wish I took more math classes when I was doing my undergrad in physics and I just really like the course that we took. This is my first semester in grad school and we used this textbook. Modern Optics elective class that I took. Actually also a pretty small textbook but totally complete and this is great. I was working in a quantum optics lab so lots of optics. Then I have the copy of the classic, The Art of Electronics by Horowitz and Hill. You have to have this book in your collection, electronics. This is the holy grail of the electronics books. And we, I don't think I covered this in class, but just having this around all these circuits and stuff, especially for experimentalists, huge. And this giant book on lasers. So again, this book I covered my first year in graduate school. So this was our quantum electronics class. I believe that was the title, my first year at University of Maryland. Very much enjoyed that. And lasers affect our daily lives so much. I mean, they're awesome. So I'm very glad I took this class and I kept this book around because I really like it. This book I adore. This is called Losing the Nobel Prize by Dr. Brian Keating and I thought this was such just it's a really well done book but it's so interesting. So this is about the BICEP2 experiment, the one that was supposedly discovered cosmic background radiation. They put out this press release and say they discovered it without doing maybe as much scientific rigor as they should have. He does such a good job explaining what went wrong and how throughout history this all happened. So it ended up being that dust and other particles got in the way of these measurements. But he also talked about the Galileo and Newton and, you know, Einstein all being kind of so closely tied to their theories, you know? They got so addicted to their theories and want to be right, they sometimes ignored scientific evidence to the contrary. So this kind of serves as a story on the dangers of doing that, but he also talks about the history of the Nobel Prize and it's a really good book. It's one of my favorite books. One of the most interesting things I learned from this book was the fact that the physicists, the Big Bang Theory, like one of the reasons that that theory is so well accepted was because physicists actually hated the Big Bang Theory because it was too close to creationism and the church loved the Big Bang Theory. It kind of helped them use this as a proof for creationism. And because physicists hated it so much, they just had so much scientific rigor in trying to disprove this theory. We need to approach science in that way, right? You get so addicted to your theory or hypotheses that you might ignore other factors that may disprove your theory. And we saw that recently in quantum computing with the Majorana fermions, right? So in 2018, Microsoft released this press release on the Majorana fermions and said they'd seen them. Turned out to be some issue, again, some, some noise that looked like what they were looking for. And it's disappointing, obviously, but if you get addicted to theory, you're more prone to thinking that that could be correct and not looking for other explanations like dust or something like that to disprove your theory. Everyone has this book, right? The XKCDs. One of my coworkers at Bleximo 3D printed out this, oh, wrong side, 3D printed out this Bleximo logo for my one year anniversary. All right, is anyone else not able to read scientific papers on computers? Because I really can't. So this is printed out thesis from Julian Kelly from Santa Barbara, John Martinez's group on fault tolerant superconducting qubits. So I printed this out and this is on my bookshelf. Okay, this next one, really special. <sighs> okay. Nice set of the Feynman lectures in physics. Obviously, I think every physicist has a copy of these and I think most people should have a copy of the Feynman lectures on physics. Just fantastic book, you know, it's a beautiful copy. I really love this. And another thesis, and this one is on Stabilizer Codes and Quantum Error Correction by Daniel Gottesman. Actually a really good thesis. It's actually pretty short for a thesis, at least nowadays, and a fantastic introduction to quantum error correction. Strange Planet, love Strange Planet, we're all weirdos, you know, so I love this. 
Algorithms in a nutshell, this is a great guide. I work on a lot of performance stuff and algorithms. I need them. I need to scroll through this book a lot. Scroll through, leaf through, whatever is not on the computer. The Lean Startup. This was gifted to me in my startup incubator that I attended right after I graduated from college. I was going to go directly to graduate school. I had gotten in, but actually I was invited to join a startup incubator and I got this book and a couple others. I think they're in my pile. They're actually in my pile over here. There's this one. Business Model Generation and the Startup Owner's Manual. These three books were gifted to me by my startup incubator and we went through them a lot because the whole point of the incubator was to get product market fit. Peter Thiel apparently hates physicists, that's what I got from this book, but it's a fun little startup book to read and it was very popular when it came out so of course I have a copy. Elon Musk biography. Aha! found my quantum book. So this is my Quantum Mechanics 1 textbook. It's Griffiths and this is the second edition. I think there's a third edition out now, but this is what I started with, which most undergrads I think start with this textbook and Quantum Mechanics 1. So two cryptography books. I got really into cryptography at some point, as some of you have seen on my blog posts and obviously talking about Bitcoin. So these are two great books for beginning in cryptography. Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. I love this book. I reread it all the time. It makes me so happy. All these quotes that are just like, the ships hung in the sky the same way that bricks don't are just so good. I just, I just love it. So I have a nice shiny gold leafed copy of this book, which also I think I didn't buy and stole from my dad. Deep learning. And I went through a deep learning phase as well. So when I worked at Coursera, I got to help out with Andrew Ng's specialization on deep learning and I really enjoyed it. So I've published a couple blog posts on it and how to do some of this code for TensorFlow and I want to get deeper into it. So I bought this deep learning book. I have the Harry Potter books here in Russian. This is an interesting book, Search Inside Yourself, and this is by someone that worked at Google. And I was going through kind of a struggle where I was not super happy with my job or what I was doing or with myself and this book kind of really helped me. It talks a little bit about emotional intelligence and you know thriving and how you just find happiness in yourself. How do you not control your emotions I want to say but how do you accept those emotions? How do you accept stress? Because you know software engineering sometimes seems like a really cushy job you get paid a lot and you can sit on your bed and code, but you know, the reality is, so for example, I'm on call. And so that means that anytime day or night, if something breaks, I can be called and be woken up in the middle of the night. And even though that doesn't happen that often anymore, it's a little bit stressful because it just kind of constantly on your mind. I'm on call for a week every three weeks. And so for those weekends, I'm like, I need to bring my laptop. I need to, if I'm gonna be away somewhere where I don't have internet signal or away from my laptop, I have to coordinate with someone to swap on call times. And that kind of made me a little bit stressed, right? Because, you know, thinking like, okay, well, I can go to a friend's house and hang out. And during the pandemic, it wasn't a problem. We weren't going anywhere. But if I wanna travel for the weekend or if I wanna go for a hike, I felt kind of very limited and very stressed and I kind of had this anxiety weighing on me. And this book, you know, is great. It really helped me out. It really approaches mindfulness and these emotions in a way I think that software engineers maybe take better. You know, I never really liked the approaches of like more woo kind of things. I also want to say I don't have a ton of books. Every single book that I have, I really enjoy and I really love because I move around a lot and books are heavy to carry. Even these three boxes, I couldn't carry them. I had to have my brother help me out. And so I only keep books that I just like have to have in my collection that I need to reference or let like truly bring me joy, Marie Kondo, make me happy. So the the ones that I keep are pretty limited and, but, but I just really enjoy them. I actually haven't started this book, but I want to start it soon. I should probably just take it to my room and it's called Lost in Math and How Beauty Led Physics Astray. So I think this is really interesting as well. And I think losing the Nobel Prize talks about this a little bit, but there's been a lot of scientific experiments and theories just because we want the math to be pretty. And so we theorize this thing that would make the math pretty. So one example of this is magnetic monopoles. So the electromagnetic equations, which I'll pop up here, 
they actually would be completely symmetrical if magnetic monopoles existed. And that's why I want to say 10 to 20 years ago, there was this huge push to find magnetic monopoles because we just really wanted that math to work out and to be really pretty. And this is another interesting book. I think I was gifted it when I was 12. So you see, I'm, it's really old and it's torn up because I've read it so many times, but it's called Sophie's World, a novel about the history of philosophy. And I'm not a huge philosophy person. I've taken a couple courses on Coursera about it, which I really enjoyed, but this was my first introduction to it, so I was, I want to say, 10 or 12 years old when I got this book, and I've reread it multiple times since, and it's a story about a girl who learns about philosophy, so you're kind of learning along with her, and it kind of weaves a story through the history of philosophy, so I've kept this one around. I don't know, it just kind of hits me and, and makes me happy. And Infinity Gauntlet, again, apparently I have lots of comic books, but, you know, debate. Did Thanos actually do anything wrong? Or was there a better method instead of just killing half of the universe, right? So now let's get into my pile of books that you'll see when I'm doing my videos because these are the books that I use all the time. Deep Work, you'll have seen this on this pile forever. I love this book. I mean, I was going through a phase where I was not focusing, obviously doing a lot of the social media. You constantly have DMs and emails and pings and this helps me get into that deep state. This taught me how to get my focus back, and I just love all of Cal Newport's books. I've read every single one. Let's look into the quantum books. So this is the classic book that I recommend to someone who really wants to actually do the university level courses of quantum. So someone that you know took the undergrad physics courses and now wants to get into quantum computing itself, this is a quantum computing book. This is not a quantum mechanics book. This is quantum computing, quantum information, goes into the circuits. I mean, this is the classic book. And uh, the author, Michael Nielsen, also has a website called quantum.country, which is a introduction to quantum computing in a very interesting format. So check that out as well. So yeah, this number one kind of resource, everyone has this if you're in quantum computing. So here's some other books that I've seen that are not textbook. These are actually more practical books. So one of them is Quantum Computing and Applied Approach. So if you're not a physics major, if you haven't studied physics, but want to get into quantum computing, but don't want to go through quantum mechanics and all these other classes, this is a really good place to start. And it's very self-contained. So it has a lot of the math background in it as well. This is a lot more approachable. So start here and then maybe go to some of the other textbooks that I mentioned. So these are two quantum programming books that I have. One is the Programming Quantum Computers, Essential Algorithms and Code Samples. So this is also very practical. It's not gonna teach you quantum computing, but if you want to actually implement algorithms, this is a great book to start with. And this is one specifically for Python and the IBM programming language. So if you want to really dive deep into Qiskit, this is Learn Quantum Computing with Python and IBM Quantum Experience. And this is very hands-on. So again, this is a practical introduction. This is more self-contained, so it's going to have some background, maybe less rigorous than some of these textbooks again, but this is supposed to be also self-contained for a programmer that wants to learn about quantum computing and actually implement the circuits on the IBM quantum experience, this is the book. Then I actually have a bunch of coding books and maybe not a ton. I think I have more science focused books because a lot of resources for learning how to program you can find online. The first book here, the one I have next to my desk all the time, the Go programming language, I don't reference it as much anymore, but this was one of the first resources that I picked up when I was learning Go two years ago. So first I did the tour of Go and then this, the Go programming language by uh, Donovan and Kernigan. I hope I pronounced that correctly, but this is just, you know, great book, has all the Go concepts in it, good explanation. So when I was learning how to program the set next to me, I would run into a concept like Go Routines Channels and look into this book. This was another book that was recommended to me when I started becoming a software engineer working with legacy code. And I always think it's so funny that programmers refer to legacy code as being code that was made like five years ago or something like that. So, you know, you want more performance, you wanna work good with other people's code. Many people who are self-taught, I did not work with other people's code before, right? And other people didn't have to work with my code. And this kind of helps you figure out how to approach a code base where you might not know exactly what's going on and how to make your code actually good for other people which is why I also have this 
clean code book because again, if you're the only one looking at your code, then that's fine. Well, maybe it's not fine because all of us have probably gone back to our own code and looked at it and been like, what was I thinking here? What was I doing? And sometimes there's a reason behind it and sometimes there's not. So I have a couple of Russian books here. Uh, we have Kurs Matematiskova Analisa, Zbornik Zadach by Fiziki, and you know, keep these around. I can read some Russian, but these are definitely not the textbooks I used in school. So I hope you enjoyed this tour of my bookshelf. I know a lot of you have been asking me to go through the books on my stack. And so you've seen those, you've seen a couple of my recommendations for coding and quantum computing books. So I hope that's helpful and a few other fun science book and treats that you enjoyed. So check out the description, I'll link the most interesting books I think for you all in the description below. And let me know if you like this, maybe we can do a tour of my dad's bookshelves because apparently we've traded a lot of books over the years and we can go through that as well because he has an amazing collection and maybe our lab bookshelf at some point as well.